Missionaries in a foreign field. 
Is he talking? Ooh, hi. That one's the most famous one there. Okay. Same, they're not bigger. Questo è l'ordine in cui si comincia? Parla prima lei? Good evening. Can you start? Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this uh, fourth day of uh, Alcantara Dialogue. Uh, today is the last panel, the fourth and last panel. And uh, in, the, in the previous days, we have discussed the relationship between sustainability and uh, design the first day and fashion the second, and uh, corporate behavior the third. Today we will discuss and we will go through the possible relationship between sustainability and uh, entertainment and art. Now I give, oh, you, are, you don't need the microphone, so Izzy Lawrence will be the moderator. Thank you, Izzy. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're on what I find a very interesting area. Um, all about arts and entertainment and the role that it might play in sustainability. So from celebrity activism to groundbreaking films, entertainment and the arts have an enormous power to get through to people, to raise awareness of issues and to inspire us to do something about it. So the rise of social media has revolutionized the way that stories reach audiences. And I think it's very interesting to also think about what the future of the role of entertainment and arts will be in sustainability. This panel brings together artists and producers from entertainment industries to explore how the arts and entertainment, including new media, can increase public awareness about climate change and also stir audiences into action. So we've got people from all different disciplines on the panel, highly esteemed panel, and I'm really honored to be here and to be mediating this today. Um, so first of all, so you can um, meet everyone, Kenny Young, who's founder of the Artist Projects Earth and has done five albums actually with Connect for Climate. Um, they're incredible, you should listen to the latest one. I was playing some tunes if you were at the party last night. And um, also a producer in his own right and has worked with so many esteemed artists, incredible um, producer. Uh, Donald Ranvold, who um, is an international film producer and who um, famously is also part of Buena Onda. And third way along, we have Freddie Grunert, who is from the International Academy of Environmental Sciences. And then Ugo Nepo Nespolo, sorry for my pronunciation, president of the National Cinema Museum in Torino. And finally, on the very end, Massimo Boturo, um, world-class chef. So as you can see, we're coming from all different angles, and it's going to be really interesting to see what each of you have to say. So I'm going to let you introduce yourselves and, your, um, and each of your roles, um, and then we're going to come back to a few questions and answers and um, have a panel discussion. Kenny, if you'd like to kick it off. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Kenny Young. Uh, I um, uh, founded a, an organization called Artist Project Earth. Um, it, it came about uh, after I spent some time in Sri Lanka. I was writing music. And, uh, and a few months after I left this village that I 
uh, a place called Tengal. Um, the, the village was destroyed by the tsunami. Um, as you all know, uh, the tsunami in, in 2004, the, uh, in December. And I decided um, that I wanted to help the villagers because I got to know a lot of them uh, and the people who lost their livelihoods, the fishermen and uh, other people who had, um, had lost lives as well and their families they, they left behind. So um, I thought, well, what can I do to help? I'm in the music business. I can, uh, I've had experience in the environment with another organization called Earth La Fund that I had been part of. So um, I, um, it was at the Sundance Festival that I, um, that I um, thought about using um, fusion in music to raise awareness. And I thought, well, to get attention um, uh, on, on a large scale, use um, uh, music to bring a message across and to use um, famous people. That's what I was hoping to do. Um, I've had that experience with my previous organization, um, having also produced other uh, albums. So um, what, um, what I did was get together with Buena Vista Social Club. Uh, that was my idea, to, to meet up with the uh, musicians from Buena Vista Social Club and to see if I can get collaborations going. Um, and the first person I approached was Sting because I knew Sting from, uh, from Brazil. Um, I met him in Brazil and uh, we talked about saving the rainforest there, which he was uh, uh, very effective in his work. And um, um, to make a very long story short, uh, he agreed to allow us to use uh, the song Fragile and him singing. And so I took that music with me to Havana and got together with the Buena Vista Social Club and we were able to put together a track which sounded very good. And then from then on, um, it went on and on. I approached Chris Martin from Coldplay and, uh, and before you know it, uh, we had an album, it, uh, as I said, a long story short. Um, the idea behind Artist Project Earth was to get a way to alleviate natural disasters as a result of climate change. Like tsunami uh, wasn't exactly a climate change issue at the time, but the natural disaster relief uh, needs to be addressed in terms of climate change. And as we see now, uh, Katrina and uh, Sandy, all the disasters that have happened uh, uh, over the years, uh, the extreme climates that we've had as a result of um, um, climate change, meant that we had to raise awareness and the way that we thought we could raise awareness best is going through uh, mainstream. You know, um, the, the, the musicians are, are uh, the, they're artists, they are the ones who communicate with the public. They are the ones who get the attention from masses of people. Uh, what we find in the environment world is that so many times we have conferences and, uh, you know, we, uh, we are preaching to the converted. Everybody is aware of what the problem is. Everyone knows we're in a terrible disaster uh, in emergency anytime, anytime something is going to hit. And, and, it, and, and it's been proven over and over. So what we we're aiming to do with our projects we, uh, was to reach a wide audience, to reach the masses, because the people who are most uh, unaware are the people who are in the mainstream. And with that, that's what we were, uh, you know, that was our goal, to attract all those people. So 
since going to Havana, since re you know, producing all these albums, um, Cuban artists, and we had Bob Dylan, we had the Rolling Stones, U2, everybody came aboard. And the last uh, year I spent in Africa and in Mali and in Kenya um, and produced uh, the, this last album, which was Rhythms Del Mundo Africa. And, and um, all the artists we had, again, Coldplay, Beyonce came aboard, even Eminem, Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, uh, Mumford and Sons. Uh, and uh, it took a long time. Uh, the, the problem is when you when you try to put a project together, you have to speak to the people who are in control, and that's the record companies and managers and publishers, and they're the ones that uh, put everything under the, at the bottom of the list, at the bottom of the pile, as you probably know. <laughs> uh, and so what, what I've always done uh, a, a, as a general rule was if I really wanted something, I persevered and, and kept going and tried a different way. Uh, so um, my, uh, what I really, I didn't even look at my notes because I, I had a lot of things I wanted to say which I'm not gonna uh, probably have enough time. I wanted uh, all my other friends, my colleagues here to speak. Um, and, and so I'll just say that um, just like John Lennon was talking about imagine, imagination, how, how imagination can change things. It's the artists who can change things and, and uh, we have to respect the fact that that's one very crucial way that we can make a dent a and in climate change and reducing and mitigating climate change. Um, and uh, artists have that imagination, that ability and that's what we are hoping that um, people will recognize and, and, uh, and we could do something about climate change that way. Brilliant. Kenny, thank you so much. And as I say, if you haven't already um, purchased the Rhythm Del Mundo CD, then um, it's compulsory. You basically have to do it. Um, let's pass over to uh, okay. Donald. Thank you. Um, my name is Don Ranvo. I uh, produce movies and I worked in uh, China uh, with Chen Kai Ge. I produced or executive produced uh, um, Life on a String and Farewell My Concubine in uh, China and then uh, primarily and then in Africa and Latin America. Maybe the better known films in Brazil were City of God and Central Station. And, um, and also I set up a film school in Bolivia in a place called Cochabamba and we do a lot of documentaries and maybe those are less known and more directly connected to climate change, especially with the Guarani community in the south of Bolivia um, that is totally surrounded by the oil companies and uh, are in a constant struggle to preserve their land. Um, I, um, I wanted to just bring a personal experience, which is just, you know, serendipitous because it happened a few days before this, this event, which is I received the script. Um, and my, my, my point is that it's difficult to talk about climate change until, as it were, it's too late. Uh, because uh, you can see it once it's happened, but people keep arguing, well, it's not because of this and that and all the rest of it. And that's, so I was very surprised to receive this script. It's, um, it starts in a typical Dutch um, family in a very Dutch environment and uh, the, the house, everything, the interiors. For 20 minutes, it seems like a normal sort of, you know, a bit sort of boring <laughs> uh, Dutch movie. And then the characters come outside uh, of the house and you're in Suriname. And, uh, and at that point, there's a flashback that starts and chronicles the arrangement that the Dutch government has made with Suriname to transport the whole of Holland to Suriname, like piece by piece, because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the water uh, the finally accepting the fact that they could not fight the water now because of climate change and everything else. And, um, and so the, the, the whole movie is really about this negotiation between the, the Dutch government and the Suriname government. 
and uh, I, the director is, uh, has convinced me that, uh, that this is actually happening and that they are in advanced negotiations. And I found that, you know, just a, a, um, a very interesting, you know, potential project to, to become involved in. Uh, I think I am here also as the president of the jury of the iChange um, competition, uh, which aims to um, inspire um, especially kids between 13 and 18 to submit evidence of climate change either through photographs or uh, up to 30 seconds uh, videos. And uh, there will be a uh, ceremony in Milan on the 29th of May to award the winners. So we've created a, an international jury that will function on the internet, of course. We don't need to spend so much money to travel and discuss things. We can do it uh, griddle style. And, um, and I, I am very proud to be, to be here for that, and, uh, but I, I'm much less knowledgeable about the, the issues as my colleagues are, so I don't want to take up more of, my, of your time and just pass over to Freddie. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm Freddie Paul Grunert. I'm a philosopher. I'm in some kind, I try to understand what does it mean when we speak about climate change. So I try to explain it in, in, in some way. So 400 years ago, humanity becomes cautioned that they are not in the center of the universe, that we live in a heliocentric universe. And they start to remap the perception of world. They are engaged like engineers of the earth. They developed languages, new media, mathematics, conceptual approaches to reality. And they start to recognize that we have not really an access to reality. So in this 400 years, we developed a very keen way of science to find out what is nature. And we try to occupy nature, we try to defend nature, but we feel all the time outside. So there was something wrong in all this 400 years. Now you never, you don't, the universe strikes back. So now we have to, be, it seems to be that we are responsible, that we are geological agents, that we have to think in 100,000 years and not more in about a few generations. So it is very difficult to feel themselves back in center. What we can say actually is that the approach we have had in the cognition theories, in the perception theories, we see the earth like a battlefield, now the perception is becoming a battlefield. So we have to find out what is the right way to approach reality. And there's a crack in reality. The crack in reality means that we need to have interfaces, and we have them. We have a lot of millions of young people in the world engaged in, with interfaces. And it's, I think, really important that we cannot go on to feel ourselves alone. So today we can say that if we are, I am, and you are. So what is really important that we have to find ourselves in a way engaged in something. We are not more occasional subjects. We are, in some way, we are everybody interconnected. but. The worst thing is that we are not only interconnected between us, we are also interconnected with animate and inanimate things, intraspecies. So we see that our world is completely changed. And climate change, I think, means that we have to find out a way to connect. And when we have seen campaign, coalition, community, I think 10 years ago it was man, materialism and money. So the thing changed. And what we have to do is to remap again. And we cannot remap to have single responsibilities. We have to find out the way to bounce new infinities. So these new infinities are the way we have to look at the things. And I think the arts, the visual arts, can do a lot of, can crack a lot of boundaries where we see that there are disciplines they make limits in reading what we are seeing. So, and the other thing is that we 
cannot go on to develop only one sense, the optical sense, how we see the things. We have to develop a multiple approach of all senses. And so we need not only the occidental view on reality, we need all the cultures we can have. So we have now a way we can call it nature culture approach to reality. And we will see what will happen. And I think we are here today to know what can be the way to make aware and what can we do to feel ourselves not alone. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, everybody's been very fast. I, I'm, I'm afraid to be a little longer, but I try to be quick anyway. Uh, this conversation for me, being an artist and being the, the president of mm, the National Museum of the Cinema, is, is concerned in the, the, the relationship between art and nature. And I, s I ask myself if there is harmony or conflict between these two words. Uh, first of all, I would like for everyone to bear in mind that this conversation is not to be intended by any means as a reactionary or passatist vision in regards uh, to the problem that, to the problem that uh, is generated while confronting art, uh, pro which is a product uh, of the man and nature. Uh, I think I have an image now. Um, yeah, it seems to me that this debate about art and nation is very important. Uh, to begin with the idea that at a certain point onwards, the harmonious relationship between artistic creation and the environment has been broken at all. Uh, next. I, we can assume that this fracture was generated with the coming of at least two great revolutions, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution. Next. And, yeah. If you take, uh, let's go next. No, more. Yeah. If you take uh, two, two great artists like Picasso and Mondrian, Picasso and Mondrian, the, the, the exact example of the transformation, let's call the transfiguration uh, from the natural to artificial. If you think about uh, the, the pink period or the blue period by Picasso going to, toward the, the, the avant-garde and, uh, and for example to the cubism, um, you see a radical deformation as an homage to the harsh law of the modernity. Let's go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I want. And then you see Mondrian. If you take Mondrian, the passage of Mondrian, when he, when he paints this, this famous tree, you, you see the passage to a very geometrical and trans transformation. Next. Next. And next. You see? This is the passage from natural, from natural, from nature to geometrical expression. Um, now, we should examine some outcomes, what, what I, I would like to call uh, a kind of violence, violence against nature. For example, you take this, this, little, this little house, which is called Malga Fosse. Uh, I would like to read briefly this. Uh, Adolf Loss was a very famous architect, American, German and American architect. He said, why would a hovel of Alpine village and generally any, any kind of rural spontaneous construction appears to be artistic in the sense of natural and not to be offensive toward the surrounding nature as a modern construction would be, although made by good, made by good ar architects. Let's do next. You see? The problem, next. The problem is, uh, the relationship between what is made by hand, the handicraft production that preserves and changes the balance of the relation human and nature. The handicraft process is consistent and concluded always in a unicum. Let's do next. You see this the salt cellar by Cellini or this uh, Giovanni Battista Foggini who work, they work both for the uh, Medicis in Florence, they do next, uh, or, or this one, you see. The industrial production shatters the balance between human, human, human and nature. The industrial art eliminates the unicum and uh, identifies with 
repetition, uh, replication. Let's see next. You see these wonderful, harmonious gard Japanese gardens? I, I think you don't see them. You, can you see the, the images? You, you yeah, see them in, see a, in a way. Action. Yeah. This is next. Next. Yeah. The industrial design is a new artistic expression in which nature has no longer the original role, uh, but occasionally appears like uh, at least like an ornament uh, or a production material. You see, this, this is a strange. This I, uh, let's do next. Yeah. This is a IKEA, IKEA store. But the next image, you will be amazed. This is a show by Martin Kippenberger at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Yeah. So nobody can, can, can see the difference be between this ready-made work and the, 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 the original work when it comes from. Let's do next. You see, this is a, a, a store, as a, like an antique store, and you, you, don't see, you don't notice really the difference between that artwork and this one. Let's, let's go on fast. And this, you, don't, you think it's a store of a bottle shop, you know. No, this is a work by a Chinese artist, Son Dong, and this is a show made in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Or if you do next, you see the repetition by Andy Warhol, the flowers, you know, this repetition, industrial repetition, because Andy Warhol, that I knew very well, he used to do this with silk screen technique. So, and then, let's go on, you see this, the design by Philip Stark, which it's absolutely against nature because this, uh, it's, an, it's nice, but it's a new full, an, an useful uh, kind of work. And uh, in the middle of fast, you see that nature turns into a simple ornament, at least. Let you see next. Okay, and next again, you see the tonnet chairs. Okay. Uh, why do we choose the Dr. Faustus? Look, let's, let's see the next image. Yeah, I choose the Dr. Faustus by Thomas Mann because the German writer, complained by Adrian Leverkuhn, who is the, the uh, an, an ethical wrong way to, he indicates an ethical uh, uh, wrong way to create in which uh, reason is no longer the expression of the union between human and nature, but is antithetical in the same way as Nazim, Nazism. You go on, which is the background of the tragic story of the Leverkusen. It's an anti-humanism. Again, uh, next. And next again. So we can say that Dr. Faustus by Thomas Mann represents the tragic hero or the fracture between human and nature. Next image. Uh, and the same author in, in the field of the music. Mm, the author of uh, Leverkusen is the author of what kind of creation? Of the, the for instance, the donic, dodecaphonic, the 12-tone music, that is the model of the composition that does not use natural harmony, but makes use of a mathematical and logic harmony. The 12-tone musician uh, does not pursue the harmonic and aesthetic unity involving the natural sensitivity of the listener because he is more interested in investigating the possible combination of sound, although it might have a natural result. Neurologist, neur neurology has identified that if music is beyond the configuration of natural harmony, natural because coherent to brainwave patterns, we perceive the sound as pure noise that cannot be, cannot be decoded. Next. Yeah, next. Okay. And now, before we finish, I would like to show you some works of art uh, dealing directly with the nature. You see, let, let's do next. You, I want you to have a look at how much the harmonica relationship between art and nature has been almost cancelled. Uh, the land art, for instance, this is a work by Robert Smithson, it's the spiral jetty. Or next, the land art, uh, the works by Christo, the curtain valley, or when he wraps uh, buildings or something like that. You see, this is a very unnatural work because, you know, the nature has been violented with plastic stuff, uh, and uh, uh, we can ask if nature for the artist is, is 
only it's a stage or it's a subject. Let's see next. Uh, and now this is a work by Burri in Gibellina, and, and then next, next picture, this, this is a work by Richard Serra in New York City. It's an iron wall that divides a square. Okay, or next. This is a funny work by Oppenheimer. Yeah, and next. And now, simply, uh, next, next image. Yeah. Um, in, 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 in England, the Omega Workshop, and it's a, it's a group by Roger Frey in 1913, tried to, to try, it tried to uh, close this, uh, to finish, to resolve this problem about uh, this contrast between uh, nature and, uh, uh, and art. They founded this little movement uh, that used to work in, in, uh, with, 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 with ends, producing little material, very, uh, art, uh, in, very in, uh, uh, you see, if you, if you take the next image, wait. They tried to, and this is the group uh, called uh, uh, the Omega Workshop, uh, uh, very, 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 very related with the Blansbury, Blansbury group by Van, with Vanessa Bell uh, and uh, Virginia Woolf. They noticed the difference, the difficulty of, of being an artist, you know, and they tried to, to, to work very closely to the nature and in a simple way. And the, and the next image, next again. One a great artist, uh, Joseph Beuys, a German artist, uh, founded the movement, if he, was, he was the one who founded the great movement in 1950. He, he was the one who really tried to conceive the various initiatives in favor of the renovation of agriculture through sculptures, drawings, debates, recording films, other works, among which the most significant, Defesa della Natura, was composed in, Bologna, in Pescara in 84. He rediscovered the artist and his new role in the contemporary world. We see his life as a path uh, which does not solely lead to the appreciation of beauty in itself, but also in the recognition of values and meanings we cannot avoid. Yeah, and I would like to finish next. Uh, af after all that I said, uh, one might think that art and nature are tied in a condition of great disharmony. Truth be told, I also had the chance to study thoroughly a mathematical relation elements which uh, throughout the centuries as representing common ground between harmony and creativity. I'm referring to the golden ratio, which is nothing more than the perfect proportion adopted for creative purposes since the pyramids of Cheops and to the fractal through the painting of Mondrian and Dali. Uh, next, <laughs> here, this wonderful number, 1.6108. Uh, you find it, next, next, you find it in, in many places. Next, you see, Cheops, next, Parthenon, you see in nature, you see this wonderful proportion, proportion that's it's under the, the construction of many works of art. You see many, you see under the Dali works. Again, next. Yeah, and in, in the Fibonacci series, you have this relationship between how, next. Yeah, this is the Fibonacci series, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, the, uh, this, yeah, next, yeah, you see this is a painting by Seurat and he said to be able to compose the painting with these perfect proportions, which is a way, uh, next, you see in nature, again, next, Leonardo, Next, Le Corbusier invented the modular, which is a formula to be able to compose architecture in a, perf in a perfect uh, uh, 
uh, rational way, harmonious way. Next. And this is the fractals. And next. This is funny because this is the battleship Potyomkin, where Sergei Eisenstein declared that he composed the frames of the film using this divine, what they call the divine proportion. If the sense of uh, harmony that ties nature and, and art has been lost, uh, our strive will be the one of rediscovering it in a sort of new equilibrium of a possible interaction and attempt to open our world to a kind of new renaissance and maybe finding the lost sense of beauty. Thank you. Thank you so much. And lastly, we hear from Massimo. Hi. I'm Massimo Bottura. I'm a chef uh, from Osteria Francescana in Modena. And uh, I just want to be testimony of uh, how the chef can help people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the nature turns up the volume and uh, you know, some big disaster at tsunami or earthquake happen. So <clears throat> I try to reflect how can uh, we can do and uh, how can we create as soon as uh, we have such a big uh, uh, spotlight on us right now and help others that are less uh, uh, lucky than us. So. I start realizing close to the slow food movement and uh, with uh, the very deep relation I have with uh, cheese maker, farmers, um, you know, uh, people like uh, raisers, fishermen, people they gave us the opportunity to transfer such a big and deep emotion through our food. Uh, how can I help them? And, uh, you know, after the earthquake we had in Modena <clears throat> one year ago, I was like very touched by that because uh, out of the blue I lost uh, uh, so many, you know, uh, supporters <laughs> and, and sometimes I'm also friends. Um, so I start, uh, I was contacted by uh, the um, all this uh, group of uh, cheese makers that makes Parmigiano Reggiano and create uh, and push the idea to create something to help them, to raise money and help them. So <clears throat> I start creating these uh, dishes, uh, these recipes. They're gonna be, they, they became a social gesture. So if you wanna see this new image, please, next. This is uh, something that comes from, uh, from uh, the idea of create, uh, uh, the idea that is uh, an icon of uh, Ita Italy, like spaghetto cacio e pepe. But I didn't, I didn't choose spaghetti, but I choose the rice. I choose the rice because of uh, a story that my first uh, mentor, an old lady, was telling me since I, uh, I start being a chef, and uh, these uh, these beautiful ladies, 50 years ago, you know the rice pickers, they were waking up just before the sun was uh, coming out. But and uh, and they were going to the train station in Nonantola, a little village where I was, uh, st I, where I start cooking, and they were singing, they were going to work all day long, picking rice, coming back in the night and cooking dinner for the husbands and the family. And so this is a, an example of uh, how we have to start again, you know, as Italians, as, you know, people that we need hope. We need, uh, uh, we need to be happy and see life in a different way. So. I choose the rice instead of choosing spaghetti. Thinking about Parmigiano, because 400,000 wheels of Parmigiano, they were damaged, so everyone was ruined uh, in, the, in the area. I start thinking about switching 
uh, pecorino with parmigiano and create, uh, without getting deep into technique that uh, they are too difficult to explain here, so create something that was pure, pure flavor. And uh, so I create this water of Parmigiano Reggiano. And the rice is created as uh, a risotto is made uh, with just water of Parmigiano Reggiano. So when you eat the rice, the rice absorbing this water and is, uh, is like eating Parmigiano in a, t in a shape of a rice. And uh, with the slow food uh, and the consortium movement, we create this event worldwide uh, during Salone del Gusto in Turin and uh, 30, 40,000 people in one night, they were cooking this kind of rice all over the world. And by Twitter, Facebook, everyone was tweeting, how can I do, how can I do this, and all that. So it's like, it's a way to, to, be, to, to give hope to these people. And in a, in a very quick time, you know, with a telephone number, people are start calling and buy damaged Parmigiano Reggiano and was sold out just before 31st of December. And uh, so these guys are there and uh, still there. Next one was, uh, is uh, a trans transform a responsibility, like uh, is, a, is a story of, from Modena to Mirandola. Is a, is a plate that uh, I create with cotechino. Cotechino is a sausage created 500 years ago from uh, the people from Mirandola that was like totally destroyed. And uh, so Cotechino, uh, uh, usually in a, in a Renaissance recipe, was uh, wrapped in pork uh, meat, uh, fried, and served with zabaione. So it was something very heavy, very uh, undigestible. And uh, so what I create, I create something that I pick from my past in a, in a critic way. I see the things in a different perspective from under the table, getting the, uh, what my grandmother was making me is a cake under the, bot the bottom of the cotechino, is a cake, well, like almond cake called sbrizolona, because if you touch it, it gets totally destroyed. And, the, and so I just load the, the, with a simple gesture well, lower the per percentage of, salt, of uh, sugar and higher the percentage of salt with uh, flour and almond. I toast and I create this light layer with uh, a cotechino, that is this sausage, to degrease, to defat, to, to create this the sense of cotechino. I cook it uh, steaming, switching uh, the water in a steamer with lambrusco, is the wine, classic. In a, that is uh, produced in a small village between Modena and Mirandola. So during my mental trip, I got uh, the Lambrusco from Mirandola and I cooked the Cotechino, start talking about the territorio. And when I arrived in Mirandola to create the Zabaione, what I did, I switched the Marsala, that is a classic southern of Italy wine, with Lambrusco, with the acidity of Lambrusco. So I start making this uh, um, uh, with this zabaione with lambrusco instead of thing, talking about the acidity, cleaning the palate, talking about the territorio. And then when I arrived in, Milandola, in Mirandola, I had this, uh, this, uh, this transformation of a classic uh, uh, recipes into a social gesture. And people there uh, from, uh, from Mirandola that they were, they were all in the main piazza trying to recreate these recipes and get the hope of uh, doing something for them. And we did it, raising the money for, to rebuild something. Next one, before we talk about Joseph Boyce. And uh, we, I, I was very, very, always very inspired by Joseph Boyce because, uh, you know, I created a, so many different plates uh, about we should never stop planting. And, um, you know, this is just a, a, a piece of art that so simple, but so inspiring. Joseph Boy spent, he created that 
the last day of his life in Capri because he was recovering by the a lung disease. And he was getting the, 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 the force from, from this, uh, uh, the energy of the lemon as uh, yellow, as, uh, as uh, the sun, as the, the color of the southern of Italy. So his, he was picking from, from the energy of these people that was surrounding him, the energy to project into the future and to, to fight against this disease. And uh, as a metaphor, you know, the lemon, I think uh, we all have a lemon inside us and uh, as a battery. And uh, maybe a tomato from Pienolo or some balsamic vinegar or a special piece of cotechino. So what I think is like uh, that we can, uh, you know, project ourselves into the future, thinking about or getting into the a poetic gesture uh, um, also, in a technical way, very important, but uh, without uh, abandoning uh, nature nor our identity. This is my Thank feeling. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's actually made me really hungry, but um, <laughs> we've still got another bit of time before I can eat anything, because we're going to ask some questions. <laughs> I think what really brings to light all of your stories is that you're all from different disciplines. It's really interesting to sort of see how there's so many ways um, that you can pr uh, approach sustainability from lots of different areas of the arts. So my first question is, you're all expert really in a certain area. What would you say is the main challenge, I'm going to start with you Kenny if you don't mind, in approaching sustainability and the different things that you can do for sustainability in your area of expertise? What are the challenges going forward you see? Uh, well, uh, I think it's good to think um, local and act global, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for me anyway. Um, what is wrong in my own surroundings and how could I apply it to the work I'm doing around the world? Um, um, I, I, see, I see a neighbor of mine destroying his own land. You know, I see him um, not caring about his own environment. And so I do what I can locally and I complain to the council uh, this is in, in rural uh, Britain, and, um, and try to stop something like that happening uh, in my own, in my own uh, surroundings. But then, um, then I start thinking about, well, what I, what I have to also do, because I am reaching, uh, fortunately, I am able to reach millions through the music that w I been producing and, uh, and, and collaborations with C4C, people who are doing the same thing and have the same goals. So we, w what I try to do is, uh, with my, uh, with Artist Project Earth, is um, get projects that are effective, but on a grassroots level, mm -hmm. having designed solutions that would work on a model that would work in a little village in Africa and, and would also work somewhere, uh, you know, in a big city in, in Asia. Um, doing, you know, little things like getting um, uh, in the slums of Kibera in Nairobi, for instance, we've helped um, uh, young people um, develop their, um, um, th develop um, shoes from tires, for instance. Um, we've, we've helped eco-villages in Jamaica who have lost their, their villages um, um, during the uh, Hurricane Sandy. I've just been to um, some of uh, the American areas that are destroyed. I couldn't believe it. I was there about a month ago and I was in Asbury Park, which is Bruce Springsteen's home ground. And some of those villages, they didn't even have power yet. 
this is five months after Hurricane Sandy. Um, so you have to empower the local people, help them do something about it. So we, obviously, we bring this to the attention of uh, a, a larger audience. And then with, with projects that come into us, we, you know, we try to um, uh, find good projects that actually work. We have, uh, you know, we have uh, um, a little, uh, um, little co cooperatives that work with um, um, surfers. They're, they're making surfer boards, not made out of plastics, but out of That's wood. Awesome certain things like that. So, I mean, there are a lot of amazing projects out there, and it doesn't have to be huge ones, because usually the big organizations don't put money into little projects. They try to do a big, big project, and it, it doesn't help the grassroots level. So, local, global, put it together and make a difference. Yeah. And um, Donald, what would you say about um, how, what are the challenges in, in film and in getting, um, getting the point across, I guess, and engaging an audience? Well, uh, one, um, one aspect has already been dealt with, which is we don't use chemicals anymore, we don't use film, I'm sorry to say in a way, but on the other, from an ecological point of view, I suppose it's a good thing. Uh, no, yeah, I was uh, the, reminded of the, the main issue in Bolivia, for example, is uh, the, the biggest challenge is uh, in the Guarani communities, the children that are attracted to the big cities and, uh, and they very often, you know, there's an 18% uh, suicide rate in, on, oh. on the Brazilian side of the Guarani <laughs> nation that commits suicide afterwards yeah. and but they do it in a in a very uh, ritualistic way because they they put a, a rope around their neck and then they climb on a tree and flip over oh. and uh, so that's that's a challenge in two directions one is obviously in the in the fact you know the contamination of these um, ancient cultures that show us alternative ways of uh, conceiving the world. For example, the Guaranese uh, traditionally separate a any piece of land into three parts. One they work, one they uh, use for rituals to give thanks, and the third one they, they give back to, as it were. You know, it remains um, as, as it is. Um, and, and so I think um, that, that, that's one thing. The other, uh, in Kibera, we did a film called The Constant Gardener. And we had a, um, we, we also engaged in a lot of uh, activities that would give them something. There is a, a Constant Gardener Foundation. After we finished the film, we created an institute that uh, is for woodwork and metalwork, so as mm. to give them something, that, you know, it's not charity. So there's fact, longevity sort of after the yeah. actual production. And we learned a hell of a lot more than, than as it were, we, you know, we gave, I mean, through this kind of experience. So uh, the final thing is in, uh, in, in Bolivia, the cocaleros, the people who grow the coca, which is a sacred, sacred plant, has nothing to do with cocaine. That's not, you know, I mean, that's a whole other story. But anyway, they build houses with uh, tins, you know, beer cans and you know that are totally energetically self-sufficient they use mm -hmm. they use also uh, glass to you know do windows and so on and so forth and i'm i'm astonished at the you know it's it's, it's it's people without a cultural background or anything but they are able to create these uh, extraordinary housing that um, that you know we could learn a lot from yeah so freddie let's get philosoph <laughs> philosophical <laughs> Yes. Um, so I'd quite uh, like to ask you about, um, about perception, the perception of sustainability and um, maybe how, how we can help to change the sort of the perception within the arts and outside. Um, I think, yes, you, you speak about perception, so we can speak about doors of perception. So we have to open all these doors of perception. So mm. this is a very important thing about 360 degrees. So 
just we have here 180, so we have to put it around, and this is the audience we have. It's about 360 degrees, mm -hmm. because have the people in streaming, so we are actually in 360 degrees. This is what we can do. We can rise um, the doors of perception. The problem is what everybody said now and before is that we organize reality in conceptual dichotomies. These conceptual dichotomies are made of nature juxtaposed against culture, or nature against humanity, or animate to inanimate. So I think what we have to do, what we have to find out is to, to think a way that we cannot see the things juxtaposed, but they are all, there's an interrelationship. And this interrelationship between us and between everything what we in some kind enters in our perception. We have to find out what is the responsibility. So to give back some kind of dignity to the things we have to manage. So what we have to do, and I think what we can propose to everybody, it's not only linked to the professionals or people. I know a lot of researchers, they are fighting for their research. So the IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change, I know how difficult it is to give this interdisciplinary code. People do not like this because they think there must be limits to every discipline. Mm -hmm. They cannot see that geological issues, um, psychological issues, issues of how we are, of our behavior, everybody is fear that there's something like a dictatory behind, that we have to do something. So what I said before is that when we are, I am. So there's not a way that someone has to tell me, I, you are not. But I know that if I want to be, everything has to be present. So we have to find out a present line, a line of presence where we can see the immanence of our actions. So this is that we are becoming new subjects. And so I think for all these researchers, for all the people, but for everybody at home, the interfaces we have actually give us a big chance to be prosumers, producers and consumers. Mm -hmm. And this makes us much more responsible, responsible uh, in front of the issues we have to see. We have to decodificate. And this decodification is a remapping of ourselves, of our position on Earth. And when we speak about degrees of freedom, we see that actually we don't even really know what is light. So shaping in a new way the universe, I think this is shaping ourselves in a new community. Yes. That's so interesting. Thank you. And um, so I want to now ask the rest of the panel, what would you... Um, what do you think is an effective way for people to collaborate that are in the arts? Uh, you both come from very different sort of um, areas of the arts. Would you think about collaborating? Can, um, can film and cooking collaborate to, to help sustainability? Yeah, m m basically what I think about, I mean, I think that the, the, the basic problem of the, I mean, it's a basic problem of this collaboration, the supposed collaboration, it's, it's a question of culture. A uh, philosopher taught us that uh, the modernity era is it's over, it was over. And then after that, we, we are living the, the post-modernity uh, moment, which is a very difficult moment. In the modernity, you, have, you were uh, running on a, on a sort of track knowing that history, it's always there. You can, you can go wherever you want, you have a track, and you know that after that, not uh, in opposition to what Nietzsche said, you were walking uh, into the dark. You know where you were going. Finishing that, you know, we are living in, in this postmodern era. We don't know exactly what to do. And in our field, you don't know how to judge. You don't know how to judge a piece of art. You don't know how to judge a film. You don't know how to judge, you don't know exactly what culture is. Mm. You, do, you don't know, especially after these two basic moments, one, 1917, when Marcel Duchamp took uh, an, uh, an orinatory saying it was a fountain, and Andy Warhol in 1964 took a, little, a box of the Brillo box, one Brillo box, and he said it was an, another, another ready-made, 
I mean, this means that the work of art is already done. You have nothing to do, you have nothing to, to put yourself with your hand, with your handcraft, you know. You, so you don't know how to judge a work of art. This, this is a very important problem. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the more difficult. We are living the, the very difficult era because if you don't know exactly what culture is, the problem of sustainability, the problem of knowing this, uh, uh, the things about uh, what is going on in the world, it's a, exactly and only a matter of culture. Mm. So what, what I was trying to explain to you before, we, we should like to, f I know it's an impossible uh, operation, we should like to find a new harmony. You said, you know, everybody knows that it's a very difficult question, but the word is lost is possibility harmony. You have to take this word, take the, the word beauty. You cannot pronounce this word because you don't know what it is, what you're talking about. You don't know what, what, you're, what is that, what's that. When you say the word beauty, uh, like uh, René Clair said, uh, Jean Clair said, like, uh, like uh, when Roger Scruton, the, the English philosopher, is talking about the beauty, you say, everybody says, oh yeah, this is a kind of reactionary stuff, you don't have to talk about that, so talk about uh, something else. But this is the essence of the world in our field, in the cinema, in the, in the arts, we should find any way because you cannot go to Venice, Venice Biennale or in, uh, I don't know, in every show, in any avant-garde shows in the world, and you, you're not being able to judge what you see, and you, and you don't know what you're talking about, if that is a work of art or not. You know what is the only way to, to judge the work of art? The price. Mm. Because if you know that that stuff has a big price, for sure you think it's a big work of art. This is the, the worst thing we can, we, the, the, the worst, worst period we are living in our life. Mm. Do you think we can change that value system? I think, I hope it will change. In, 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 from all over the world, people is working on, the, on this uh, different, to try to find a new attitude uh, in judging. But not only be, if you are an artist, you don't know exactly, sometimes they have young artists that call me and say, what I have to do, you know, I would like to, you know, uh, I, want, I would like to show you my works, you know, what I have to do to be, to be an artist, because you know that uh, the, 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 the hand capacity is finished. You know, you cannot judge, you don't, you don't judge no more anymore. Absolutely, a work of art by the ability of the hand. You, you don't know what, where, to, where to start and where to finish to judge works of art. So you have to find, again, one point. And uh, that, that old rusty track we were talking about, where your train is, is, is walking slowly, sure not to fall down in a, in a, in a big black hole. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just start with a story. You know, a few years ago, we went uh, to the delta of the Po River to, to film a, a short movie about a story that my mom was telling about the eel that wants to go back to his roots. And uh, it's just thinking about the the idea of the Duke of Estensi, Estensi family, that uh, the uh, late uh, uh, 16th century, they moved the capital from Ferrara to Modena. And uh, the whole recipe is about this historic photograph. So we arrive at the Delta de Po, me, my wife, and then, and we found uh, this, uh, because the Delta de Po is one of the few places in the world where you can fish eel. And they are incredible. And, uh, you know, and we found this uh, incredible park that was so abandoned and uh, dirty. And uh, there were just uh, three people in the old Delta working there to keep uh, uh, the, the park just, you know, alive. And uh, so everything changed. In that moment, everything changed. So we start filming this uh, guard denouncing the state of the park. And uh, so we, we filmed that. 
and we finished the whole film. It was more, more a denounce about that. And we went to the Regione Emilia Romagna as soon as they know me very well. And uh, so I said, I want to talk about something that is very important. The Delta of the Po, one of the best park in Italy we have. It's incredible, beautiful things and is, is dying. So they listen. Uh, for the first time, for me, the first time that an Italian politic listened to, what, to my words and they invest immediately in six months and in one year 18.5 million euro to clean up everything, to hire more people and uh, to open new um, uh, um, activities, to give That's life incredible. to this place. So, from this, you know, I start getting confident, you know. Oh, pero, that's great. You know, I have such an impact, so I'm trying to help some more people. So, the mayor of a school, because culture comes from school, so the people that was going to teach this young, you know, educate the young generation to be more conscious, to be more alert, to just to learn. That's why I, I, I keep pushing the young chef not to be so rushy to be in the kitchen and learn crazy things, but to stay and study in school. So this uh, agricultural school uh, that gave uh, the most important winemaker, farmers, you know, they were, it was going out of business. They had to close because they don't have any found. They cut here, they cut there. So I said, okay, I'm going to help you. But uh, you have to know, do, to understand me. What I'm saying is like, I would love to have these uh, farmers. They're going to grow and they're going to study close to the future chefs. So if a farmer, uh, a, a cheesemaker, winemaker, and, and the future chefs, they're, they're going to grow together. The chefs, they, they're, they're going to know how he's going into the kitchen with the hand dirty of hearth and smelling milk from the morning. So have respect for the ingredients in their recipes. And, uh, you know, after two years, there are two class of chefs. They are growing and they are milking the cows and they are harvest the Lambrusco grapes, and they are making Parmigiano Reggiano, and they are taking care of the battery for balsamic vinegar. So this is something I, I think uh, to preserve the biodiversity and to help uh, one spoon at a time, you know, people to grow. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to ask all of you now what you think about the um, about celebrity activism and about some successful projects that have come off the ground in that way and, uh, and how, to, how do you engage the power of celebrity in, uh, as a force for good and a force for sustainability? Who wants to answer? <laughs> well, I, I have one that struck me very much. It's uh, Greta Skaki who initiated uh, Fish Love, which were very striking images with naked women and all sorts of fish, all, always a different kind of fish and it's like really curious, but it has a sort of force the frap, which really... Yeah, it was for overfishing, that yeah. campaign, wasn't it's it? It's about overfishing. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, it, well, it's definitely striking. I think anyone that's seen a sort of naked Lizzie Jagger next to a fish remembers the image, basically. Um, do you ever think that people go too far? Do you think we can go too far with celebrity activism? Where do you think the spectrum is? Um, no, I, I think... Um, I think Celebrities are, aren't going far enough to, to help answer. the environment. I think they, what they do is uh, the minimum they can do, and then they say, well, I've done that. They don't really uh, put themselves out there in the front. I mean, um, to give you an example, Sting, Sting started out fighting... Uh, uh, you know, he was an activist to save the rainforest, and he did 
a lot for the rainforest. He still does, but his, the aura around him, because of media, because of the press, had sort of, you know, they, t they sort of said, oh, you know, he's doing this just to, to get, you know, to get in the limelight more or whatever, and, and it went against him. And as a result, a lot of, a lot of famous people uh, Sean Penn, the same thing. Sean Penn came out and did some great stuff to help the Haitians after the mm. big hurricanes. And he, you know, he also was criticized. There's always, there's always that thing that gives, um, gives doubt to celebrities. Do they go on? And most of them are driven by fame and, and wealth. So uh, to take a chance, uh, they, they, uh, they find it difficult because everyone is against them to continue and get themselves more involved and more, uh, more out there. So what I say is, no, that's not the case. The case is that the celebrities aren't really doing enough, and that's because the fear of losing their celebrity. Mm -hmm. I think that's what a problem is. Freddie, what do you uh, think? I think that I will mention one of these celebrities, so it's Leonardo DiCaprio. I was mm -hmm. really impressed because it's, it's a, a dangerous concept, celebrity, but I was really impressed not only by Shuttered Island, by Inception, because he's speaking about the perceptions, about the door of perceptions. I was really impressed when I found in internet something I think he, he produced, by him, produced by himself. 15 minutes about climate change. Yeah. So it was really something that I see that someone gives himself the time to say something runs wrong. So, and I have to pronounce myself. It was not so um, a very, very scientific text, what he, was, what he speaks, but you see himself that it was something he created. You, mm -hmm. you see something really what I call the immanence of the problem. So you see himself looking for something, it was like a titanic situation, in love with something, and for perhaps a paradise research. You feel a lot of feelings in this celebrity. And this was a great moment for me to find that nobody was speaking about this action from him. Mm -hmm. So you, I find it really in an accident way on, in, in, on, in the World Wide Net. So I think celebrities can do a lot when they do something, not only being celebrities, but working out to bend the trend, you know, to find something where they can contribute to rise and something quotients. genuine, maybe. Yes. Yes. Because I think it sounds like that particular piece from Leonardo DiCaprio yes. was very yes. sort of genuine, something he may not have scientifically known everything about, but just essentially something, his yes. view from his heart. So and, and in, this way, in, in this way, he connected to Dirty Data because he takes together personal feelings, empathy, and all these things. People need to understand that we cannot decide, um, I think it's Ugo what he's telling, that the, the criteria we have to, to look at these things are really difficult because they are really complex and people are afraid of complexity. Mm -hmm. So, but we have simple things, we can say, common good is something important. Property must not be the first thing for the constitution of nations. So commons are atmosphere, oceans, the crust of the earth. So we have, and I think also culture is something what we have to define in some way like a common good. So this is how we can work together to find out something in this way. So this is, and for this, the World Wide Net is really important. It's important that we are in streaming, that people feel that they can contribute. So. Um, just, just I'm, I'm talking before because uh, you know I have a He's train get a to train. catch. Uh, I'm losing it. it yeah. <laughs> now, just uh, because sometimes celebrities they, they can be also in danger when they do something so important, you know. Yeah. And uh, because uh, uh, you mean they can I, 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 Yeah, that can be very dangerous for them when you do yeah. something and you touch something. Uh, in my my, you know. Uh, um, place, you know, uh, uh, in, in my category, what can I do, you know? There is a chef from South America, he's the most important chef of South America, he's from Peru, uh, he's, he's not a celebrity, he's more, 
if, if he runs for president, he's going to be the president. The next president in Peru is called Gaston Acurio. Gives hope to the young. If you go in Peru, you see all these young uh, kids, they want to be a chef because of Gaston. And, uh, you know, a few years ago, he did a project to transform the, all the field uh, to give the opportunity to the campesinos to transform the field in, from Coke to uh, coffee or chocolate, beans, potatoes, these farmers. Some of them, they did. They got the money, they transfer everything, they change it. And uh, one of them won the prize as best coffee producer, organic coffee producer in the world. And that was on all the news and everything. But Gaston, now he has to drive and with uh, bodyguards everywhere because of uh, his job. And uh, he doesn't have a life, you know, more. It's like crazy. Yeah. So, so sorry, I have to leave because I would be, I would stay here, you know, till no, tomorrow, you know, because I, <laughs> it's so interesting. Everything is like so interesting. So I'm so sorry. But no, I thank you so I much. To, We're going to give you a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Um, um, okay. I, think I was thinking about what they say, of course. Uh, the, for me, the answer is very, I mean, I, I want it very simple. I was thinking, and I think everybody, everybody has to do something for yeah. this. But uh, I like what Andy Warhol said. He invented an aphorism, very, very clever, as always. He said, in the future, everybody will, be, he will have 50 minutes of celebrity. This means that, because I have the, in my, in my idea, and what I can see, very often I think that celebrities take more than, they, than what they give. So, what I hope, it's really that in the future, everybody could have his 15 or 5 minutes of celebrity to be able to, to, to do into this field and to solve some of this very tough and, uh, and, and, uh, and absolutely uh, and, 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 and this very tough problem that we have to solve. Because we, don't, we cannot uh, leave the celebrity the, the task to solve all these problems. And I think it's not, uh, it's not even right to do it. So no. everybody has to do his part. That's what I think. Yeah, that's really interesting and kind of wraps up. I was going to say the, the sort of last question I really have for you as a panel is what can, um, what can everybody do? What is there? What's the role for actually for anyone in the arts or entertainment at any stage, whether you be, you know, an aspiring filmmaker that makes some short films, whether you be a, uh, someone who wants to be a journalist, how can you sort of engage and enhance um, young people into, um, into actually taking action? Well, they can apply for the I Change competition. <laughs> yes, that's number one. Tick. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, I think uh, everyone, everyone should be aware of, yeah. of what's happening yeah. on the planet. That's the first thing. In order for them to be aware, they really have to be educated. Mm -hmm. So. Education has to start at a very young age and keep going right through all this schooling. Um, and, you know, I mean, we're, we're at the mercy of governments who are, are very blocked when it comes to doing something really bold because the economy is the number one thing. And, and, and the way we're structured, the way the multinationals and the politicians and everybody else and the lobbying by the big fossil fuel companies, every, the odds are against us, you know, the odds are against us. But it, I think we're very fortunate that we have social network that is so effective in the last the 20, word. well, not 20 years, I mean, the last 10 years and the last five years, social network has, has brought a huge upsurge of concern from the public and organizations like Avaz was you know who are getting mobilizing two million uh, people 
uh, you know, to write in, and you know, everything that is looks like a, a problem uh, can be overcome by having masses of people. It's that's what it is. It's numbers. It's us. It's us who are saying, "Come on, do something." You know, we're trying to get to raise raise awareness for all the problems in the world, but climate change is number one. It's really, without a planet, you can't, who cares about the economy, you know, without the, you know, without the safety net. You know, we have to do something. Okay, I'm gonna take some questions out to, um, out to our audience. I can't see a thing, but our beautiful audience. <laughs> um, so, oh, there's an audience out there? Yeah, there's an audience behind the screen. So do we have any questions? Everyone's a bit shy. Maybe we'll take some from Twitter, if not. Hmm? Question that we had. Yeah, you have a question. Yes, easy. No, no, I have not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I want just perhaps to encourage, you know, because I think climate change, change is a big chance because we are just too late. So it's a big chance because we are not anymore in a race. We have a tachometric society where everybody was running in competition. So this is what you say with the economic. Um, I think it's over. So we are not more in competition. We are not more in this tachometric way that we have to be in progress all the time. So the climate change gives us a big chance to think that now, now people have another fear, that's true, that the internet gives social networks, make the fear that one can be no more there from one moment to another. He can be totally vanished outside, that there's nothing he can reflect. So this is a new fear, but it's not a fear of competition, it's a fear of how to be connect. So we can, should be also very careful what is the social media, how we are connected. So climate change is a big chance with the awareness to what makes us together. That it's not only the social media, the medium is all, everything what we, it's a cultural phenomenon. So it's just something what is inside the climate change, the rising of new media. We have to learn, we have to find out what can we do with it. How to harness it. Yes, and this is I think the big chance we yeah. have and to get out of competition because it's not a competition between us, between no one. So. It's just lost this kind of competition. Well, I'm now going to seamlessly segue, as you're talking about social media, into some questions and things that have come from Twitter. So we've got one question here. Are entertainment and the art sectors leading the way with sustainability? And do you take inspiration from other sectors? From other sectors. And would you say that, so would you say arts and entertainment are leading the way with sustainability, or do you take inspiration from other sectors that are doing it better than <laughs> inspiration us? Inspiration is, <laughs> is, is a very tough word. I mean, somebody says it's more important transpiration than inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Transpir I like that. Transpir Transpiration. 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 <laughs> because somebody says, you know, to You're the artists, right. usually they say, when you get your inspiration, when you create, uh, you know, because there is this old fairy tale that artists usually create in the in the night uh, when uh, you know a storm is coming and uh, an artist you know creates uh, like uh, like a priest uh, is uh, his own uh, personal history that is only understand you know this is a bad literature uh, side uh, inspiration uh, I, for me but I think for for the modern art for the contemporary art it comes out from Exactly, from the nature, from the real world. Because the best thing to do today, and I think it's the only way, it's, re it's the idea, is the capacity to bring art into real life. Because if art, it's only uh, an extra, uh, something, you know, just good, good only for collectors and then stay in the, in the dark side of your room. It's not very important. To integrate it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the point, uh, the, real, the real point, that can I throw uh, 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 also to this question you posed today and we, we were talking about, uh, it's awareness was a good word, awareness, it's a very good word, but the point is to be aware that art is not 
separate section of the, of the real life of the world. No, because if no. art is not really connected to the two... If you, if you ask me, for instance, what, if, you, if you propose me this question, what is for you, what is art for you? I could answer it, in, if you want, in a sociological way, historical way, say art is what testify today, the, 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 the real world, you know? You know, I understand that it's not a, a good answer, but it's true. If you take an history art book, you see through the, through the pages that every period testify, every per art period testify is a historical period. If you had a, you know, so today artists to testify what, you are, what we are living. That's why artists to be connected not only for the prize, not only for, you know, for something that comes from the outside, but for to be really able to testify what kind of life we are living now. You understand? Mm -hmm. So that inspiration comes from that uh, uh, connection that you have to absolutely to, to find, to, uh, uh, and, 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 and try to reach. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that art is used to inspire. Um, and, and people can get inspiration, and as a result of inspiration, they can act. I think a lot, what, what we can do is look at a sector of society that is actually, you know, talking their talk, doing their, doing their talk, uh, are able to, to um, cut their foot, you know, their footprint on the planet by, by actually doing something, by you know, building little communities where the impact is very, very light and the small, the small footprint uh, uh, on the planet. And there are countries, and there, there, there are a lot of uh, countries that are encouraging cities, little cities to, to uh, become more self-sufficient and more have sustainable lives and that's where we that's the sector of uh you know of what that would inspire artists to inspire other people and you know that's what it, that is a good way to to uh that's that's the vision that people should look at go on you just because art is inspired by trouble so <laughs> Real artwork is where trouble is. And I think this is what, and climate change is a big trouble. <laughs> so I think yeah. this is where we can work. We should go out and disrupt it. Be troublemakers. <laughs> or trouble solution people. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have to wrap up because of time. It's been so interesting and amazing. Can we give a big round of applause to our panelists, please? Incredible talk. And a last point from me, I'd also like to thank Alcantara and also everyone at Connect for Climate, in choosing, including Lucia Grain over there and her team. They've done a brilliant job. This has been so amazing, and I, for one, feel really privileged to be part of it. Um, and everyone should listen to Rhythms Del Mundo and watch all these amazing pieces of art take off and do their bit themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Really?